guys, and welcome back to period six of AP US history. Last time, we talked about the rise of industrial capitalism. Now, predominantly that entire lecture was happening in the Northeast. So we saw people like John Rockefeller <laughs> and Andrew Carnegie create a brand new era of economic capitalism in America. Now, the two regions we left out were predominantly the South and the West. <laughs> and so today, <laughs> with my helpful friend here, we're going to look at how exactly industrial capitalism is going to change the South and the West. And with that, let's get into it. Period six. Period six. Gilded age. Yeah. Woo! Before we start, remember, we're in the Gilded Age. 1865 to 1898. Things look nice on the outside, but don't let that nice little gold outer layer fool you. It's gross on the inside, so we gotta figure out why. Let's do it, let's go. So just a little bit of a heads up. This could be a chunky Ed puzzle. You already probably know this based on the length of it, but at least I'm warning you, a friendly warning ahead of time. I have worked in an intermission, which is a really bad sign, but I've worked in an intermission to make sure that you guys could at least put a pause on this and kind of break it up. Because what we're doing really is two potential lectures shoved into one, but they do have the common theme of how are we going to look at how the Gilded Age and how this rise of industrial capitalism is going to reshape the West and the South. So we're gonna start though by looking at how exactly the West is being transformed during the Gilded Age. Now to start, the first thing we're actually gonna do is back up into the middle of the Civil War which feels like cheating because Civil War technically was you know, two eras ago. And so we're gonna have to go back and look at some of the policies that Lincoln comes up with during the Civil War that are going to lay the foundation for the ways in which the West is transformed during the Gilded Age. So one of the key developments that is going to take place during the Civil War, and pretty much during any war we see from here on out, is that as the United States gets itself into wars, you will see a rise in the amount of power that the federal government will take and use during that war. One of the ways that the federal government is going to use that power during the Civil War is in an attempt to shape the West on a free soil platform. And so what we will see is that as this federal power goes up under Lincoln during the Civil War, part of that policy will be shifted towards how can we continue to expand while the Confederacy is no longer really an issue and we can really shape the West in terms that the United States is comfortable with. And so they're going to try and create, again, further expansion, further settlement based on this free soil platform. One of the ways that they will do that is in 1862, they come up with an act called the Homestead Act. And so the entire purpose of the Homestead Act is to accelerate American settlement of the West. And so what it does, it's pretty straightforward. It says, hey, have you ever rebelled against the United States? And if the answer is no, then you can get 160 acres of land for free in the Great Plains. It's beautiful and flat and there's plenty of grass. You will love it, I promise. All you gotta do is live there for five years, make it livable, and it's all yours. And a lot of Americans and a lot of immigrants look at this and look at this as an opportunity for advancing themselves. And so the Homestead Act is a federal piece of legislation that is actively promoting the settlement of the West on this free soil platform. Now. The problem is a little bit in the recipe of the Great Plains themselves, and we'll get to that in one sec. But as we can kind of reshift and re-kind of construe our understanding of American Expansion West, during the Civil War up through the Gilded Age, it becomes federally sponsored. And so you're going to have federal sponsorship of westward expansion and settlement, but you're also going to have a much more corporate mindset to this as we move in. As Americans begin to go west, there's a specific group of people that have to adjust to life on the Great Plains. So we're talking about areas like Kansas, Nebraska, these places that are very flat, very dry, and have a very low amount of waterfall every year. And so these people become known as sod busters, people who are breaking up the sod or the dirt. And as they do so, they're having to really create a life from a different type of environments than really was anticipated. On screen right now, you see a American who has traveled into Kansas, has created what we call a sod house, 
out of this dirt because that's what is there. The number of trees is so low that it is almost impossible to have a kind of standard Victorian style home that many Americans have in the East. And so again, Americans are having to really combat the environment in this Great Plains area as a result of the Homestead Act in ways that they previously hadn't thought was going to happen. Not only that, but you also have the issue of Americans having to deal with irrigation and agriculture. How do you farm in an area that is not conducive to farming? One of the ways that they try to combat this is going to be through dry farming techniques and adapting the environment to take advantage of the low amount of rainfall over time to ultimately eke out a living on the Great Plains. Now, like I said, one of the defining characteristics of the transformation of the West during this period, not only is this federal sponsorship of westward expansion or corporate sponsorship of westward expansion, and one of the defining ways in which we can see that is through the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. Now, we've had discussions about the kind of railroads going out west for some time now, even back to Stephen Douglas, who's trying to get his railroad all the way to Illinois, so he proposes the Kansas-Nebraska Act. It's at this point, though, following the Civil War, where we're finally going to have a railroad that spans the entire continent of the United States. And so if we're trying to think about specifics, and we're looking at the Transcontinental Railroad as a whole, what is it defined by? Let's just talk about that for starters. This expansion that is happening as a result of the Transcontinental Railroad is defined primarily by, again, number one, the fact that businesses themselves are taking over the American expansion project that is going to happen into the West. You're going to see these monopolies, these kind of businessmen in the East, really take an interest in this and really develop a strong hold over the development of this Transcontinental Railroad. The second characteristic that is going to define the development of the Transcontinental Railroad and railroads as a whole in America is going to be that they almost always have in common a shared labor base. And so for these projects, these railroad companies are going to predominantly use immigrant labor. And specifically, you're going to see that a large portion are either Irish immigrants or they are Chinese immigrants. And as we see these two railroad companies competing to finish the Transcontinental Railroad, more on that in a second, you'll see that coming from the East, you'll see a lot of Irish immigrants. And then coming from the West, you'll see a lot of Chinese immigrants, both on these two different tracks, trying to complete the Transcontinental Railroad. And then the third thing that really defines this whole project of railroads expanding westward, again, is the fact that the federal government is right there behind it at all times, promoting this growth and expansion. And the predominant way that they're going to do that specifically is going to be through financial support. They're aiding on these different companies and they provide federal subsidies, or again, just another term for financial support for these projects to promote westward expansion. The final thing in the effect is going to be that railroads then, once they are completed and once you have this project actually done, which again, takes some time, and a lot of manpower and a lot of lives, you're going to see that the fact that the United States now has a much more intricate system of railroads leads to access to distant markets they previously didn't have and new avenues of untapped wealth that, that again, they previously did not have as readily available to them. And so specifically, if we're trying to think about what are some examples we could talk about, cattle is a great one for Texas. The fact that you now have railroads crisscrossing the West allows for cattle drives to actually be completed relatively easily and create a lot more profit for these farmers and ranchers in the South. The other one is going to be gold, obviously getting the wealth out of California, Colorado, the mountainous areas of the country that is going to lead to more and more wealth. And so again, before we move on, it's so important to note and it's so important to really understand how the Gilded Age as a whole and industrial capitalism really reshapes things the focus for the transformation of the West is guided by the federal government and it's guided by these business owners who are taking an active interest and investment in this project to the point where you will see political cartoons like this one on screen where this same figure who becomes emblematic of the Gilded Age, Fat Moneybags Man, it's his official name, um, Mr. Fat Moneybags Man, becomes just a part of this process he has made his way from the Northeast and now he's coming out West to promote this business expansion and ultimately the cultural expansion of Americans as a whole. 
So the natural next place to go is the more difficult part of this legacy for Americans to have to grapple with. And again, that's the continued displacement and destruction of Native American lives at the cause of American expansion. And so at the end of the Gilded Age, this is really the moment where ultimately, for the most part, Native Americans as a whole that are not going to be on reservation lands are going to be removed from the United States as a whole. And so our goal is figuring out how exactly does that get there? This has been a struggle that has been part of the American story now for the better part of this class. And as we make our way to the Gilded Age, that story begins to have its ultimate conclusion. And it's going to start, quite simply, with a piece of legislation that's attempting to assimilate Native Americans to American culture. And the piece of legislation that we're going to focus on, for the most part, at least as we focus on indigenous resistance to American expansion Canadian, is going to be the Dawes Act of 1887. So this is at a point where ultimately we're reaching the end of the Gilded Age, but this is going to be a policy that is the final nail in the coffin, really, of continued conflicts between the United States and Native American populations of the West. And so the Dawes Act, quite simply, is an attempt to force assimilation, or this policy of trying to make Native Americans adapt and adopt American culture in an attempt to further remove them from westward expansion of many Americans. Now, the way that this policy actually does that is pretty different. What they do is they're going to go to individual Native Americans and tell them that they will buy tribal lands for X amount of dollars. When they do so, they ultimately will pay one individual for a specific plot of land, and then they provide a very small portion of that to the Native American that they could then work as kind of a settled agricultural family. Again, forcing this style of lifestyle on Native Americans. Ultimately, though, what's happening is that as larger and larger tribal lands are sold and Native Americans are put onto smaller and smaller portions of land, it becomes almost untenable for most Native Americans to live in this style of life and are either forced to A, completely assimilate, which is ultimately part of the policy, or remove themselves to places like Canada and other areas. So in response to the Dawes Act and in response to American expansion as a whole, there's a movement that occurs that is going to attempt to promote the removal of the white population from the West by Native Americans and ultimately turn the clocks back one more time. We've seen this type of movement among Native Americans in the face of white American expansion pretty numerous. Beginning in the late 19th century, we see a spiritual movement that is going to spread throughout the tribal plains Indians called the Ghost Dance Movement. Now, yes, there is a specific dance that is taking place that is attempting to achieve a political, social, and racial effect. So Native Americans of the tribes that live among the Great Plains perform this dance in an attempt to ultimately rid the lands of further white settlers and try and bring back a period of Indian superiority in America. Now, naturally, as the U.S. Army begins to expand westward and tries to assimilate these Native American populations or remove them, this type of movement is very dangerous and threatening. When it, you have Native American groups who you're trying to convince to live settled agricultural lives and they are promoting this idea that we can turn the clock back and remove Americans, it's very much antithetical to your whole entire point as a U.S. government official and American as a whole. And so this brings us to one of the more disheartening stories that we will have in the Gilded Age. It comes to the attention of the United States Army as they continue to expand into these tribal plains areas, trying to control, police, remove Native American populations, that there is a group of ghost dance followers who are performing this ritual in South Dakota. Now, as we look at the ways in which this what ultimately is a massacre has been kind of brought down to us through history. For a long time, it was called a battle, and that could not be further from the truth. At this location in Wounded Knee, South Dakota, there is a large portion of Lakota Sioux men, women, and children 
who have gathered in a ravine. And ultimately, the very brief version of the story is that the United States Army puts a machine gun at the top of this ravine and fires into it for minutes, massacring the entire population of these Lakota Sioux Indians, all because they were threatening to perform this dance movement and be a part of a resistance movement to American expansion. Now, while the massacre itself is absolutely devastating to Native American autonomy and authority in the West, by far the biggest effect of this massacre is that by the end of it, almost all of the members of this ghost dance movement, the Lakota Sioux and all these different tribal Plains Indians are going to move themselves away from their homes in America in an attempt to avoid further bloodshed. And this really becomes the final moment where you see direct conflict between Americans and Native Americans within the United States. You'll have smaller skirmishes, but Wounded Knee becomes emblematic of a absolutely devastating, emblematic depiction of the way in which this conflict and relationship has been carried out between Americans and Native Americans for the better part of hundreds of years. And so with that, guys, we're gonna take a little bit of an intermission here. Get up, stretch your legs, do what you need to do. But hey, you know what? If you're still feeling good and you're ready to go, keep on going and I'll see you in the New South. So we just saw that the transformation of the West during the Gilded Age pretty much can be defined by the fact that you now really have a lot more federal sponsorship <laughs> and you have businesses taking an active role in the promotion of American expansion. And that ultimately comes at the cost of indigenous peoples in the American West, right? Well, now we have to think about what is that same industrial capitalist mindset? How does that look in the uh, American South? And so really, you know, I think we can just jump right into it. Wait, what's that? Oh, what's that? Thanks, Mr. Mailman. It's a letter. It's the letter of the day. Oh, that means we should have to. We just got a letter. We just got a letter. We just got a letter. Wonder who it's from. Okay, it's the letter of the daytime, which means we need to look at it. Does it say who it's from? All right, let's see. This letter is from Henry Grady. He works. In Atlanta, he's a newspaper writer and he talks about the New South. What did he have to, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> oh, it's warm in here. So Henry Grady, who is an Atlanta newspaperman, becomes really famous for coining this idea of the New South. Right after the Civil War, the South is trying to figure out what exactly are we gonna do to put the pieces back together. Now we've already seen the racial legacy of how the South is going to put itself together. Henry Grady offers a new understanding for what the South is all about. And so Henry Grady says the following. There was a South of slavery and secession. That South is dead. There is a South of union and freedom. That South, thank God, is living, breathing, growing every hour. The Old South rested everything on slavery and agriculture, unconscious that these could neither give nor maintain healthy growth. The New South presents a perfect democracy, the oligarchs leading in the popular movement. A social system compact and closely knitted, less splendid on the surface, but stronger at the core. A hundred farms for every plantation, 50 homes for every palace and a diversified industry that meets the complex needs of this complex age. So Henry Grady is clearly offering a brand new vision for the American South. And his goal is pretty straightforward when you think about it. He's promoting a new South that is based on capitalism, on industrialization, and on attempting to do away with some of the elitism that had previously been a part of the American South. We're talking about like the really rich plantation owners, and he hints at that a little bit. And so 
Henry Grady is hoping that the South will take this turn and kind of shed off these shackles of being this colonial producer for the North and all the factories in the North, and that the South itself will start to produce some of those same elements and be much more like the North than they have been at any point in American history. Henry Grady's vision of the South sounds fantastic. It sounds like a new era for a region of the United States that had been plagued by racism and by ultimately industries that left them in the wake of the North. But sadly, during the Gilded Age, the South is not going to escape its previous issues on any front. And so what we see during the Gilded Age is that while the South had potentially had hopes for becoming an industrialized power like the North, it finds itself grappling with these same issues of race that it had constantly been dealing with since the founding of the United States. Now, two main ways that the South is ultimately going to fall back into the same pattern of attempting to oppress the free people of the South, we're gonna look at two main ways that that occurs. And number one is going to be through an attempt to find a loophole in the 13th Amendment, instituting a new system of neo-slavery throughout the American South, and then through a active policy of disenfranchisement. Now, if you remember back to Reconstruction and this passage of the 13th Amendment, we know that the 13th Amendment straight up outlaws slavery in the United States. And yet, in the language of the 13th Amendment, which still proves to be controversial to this day, it says that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude can be instituted in the United States except as a form of punishment for a crime. And Southerners, during this period of reconstruction into the Gilded Age, look at the language of the Constitution and embrace that loophole as a means of attempting to keep the racial divisions between white and black in the South permanent. One of the primary ways that you will see time and again that this loophole is executed is going to be through what we call vagrancy laws. Now, vagrancy laws are incredibly subjective. Let's just say that from the start. The purpose of the law is that if you see somebody in your local town, in your state, who appears to be homeless or without a job, you can arrest them and you can force them into employment for the state for up to three months. And the problem with this law is that ultimately it is up to the subjective mind of whoever is going to be prosecuting that law. Now, as you would assume, the problem with a vagrancy law, while if it's applied evenly, seemingly is, has no issues. In the American South, though, this law is going to be applied predominantly to African-Americans as a means of keeping that part of the community under control and suppressing their ability to actually gain the freedom and the promise of freedom that was applied by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Now, while the attempt to maintain this system of neo-slavery or peonage using these vagrancy laws is going to be pretty common, the far more common and visible way in which the South attempts to rob African Americans of their constitutional rights is through voter suppression or dis And so this entire period of the Gilded Age really becomes defined by this friction between this large community of African Americans who are attempting to exercise their 15th Amendment right, but are going to be suppressed by this large group of Southerners. So if we're talking about black disenfranchisement in the South, what are the primary means then that the Southerners are attempting to rob them of this constitutional right. There's three that we're gonna focus on specifically that are pervasive across the American South. In the South, American Southerners are going to find technically legitimate ways to curb the voter turnout or ability to vote of some Americans. Now, technically, these means are not unconstitutional just if you're looking at it just on the surface. As soon as you get beneath that, you're like, yeah, that's absolutely absurd. But what they do is they try to find ways to take advantage of the socioeconomic condition of most of the African Americans in the country at this time and really rob them of their right based on that. So the first kind is going to be what we call a poll tax. Ultimately, you come to a voting station, you are ready to vote, and they ask you to pay a tax to vote. 
And ultimately, this is going to hit the lower elements of the socioeconomic ladder hardest to the point where if you're a poor family, you won't have that extra money to spend and thus you can't vote. And so this is an extra legal means of attempting to rob African-Americans from their ability to vote. The second one is going to be a very similar situation. You turn up to a polling station, you're ready to vote, and they ask you to read the Constitution. And again, it's applied to everybody, hypothetically, and you read the Constitution, you're able to vote. But ultimately, this is going to hit the group of people hardest who are uneducated, and predominantly in the South, we're going to look at that, and it's going to be this large group of freed people who have not been afforded the opportunity of education. So again, an extra legal means of attempting to rob them of their ability to vote. And then lastly, and this one is kind of the more pernicious one where it's, if your grandfather could vote, you can vote. And while you could apply that to the entire population and it sounds like equality, it could not be further from the truth. A grandfather clause is fundamentally designed to rob African-Americans from the ability to vote. Because if you're saying, hey, could my grandfather vote and they were a slave, well, then the obvious answer was no. So a grandfather clause is just another outright attempt to rob African-Americans of their ability to vote in the American South. Now, one of the biggest legacies of the American South during the Gilded Age is the rise in segregation. As American Southerners attempt to understand how they can move forward with this large portion of former slaves that are now African-American citizens of the United States, the sheer possibility of just suppressing them is only half of the battle that they are willing to fight. There is a fundamental belief that the two races just need to be separated. And this is where the story of segregation comes into American history. And so it's during the Gilded Age that we're going to see the rise in segregation and attempts to legalize segregation that become so problematic as we move into the 20th century. Now, the first attempt at legalizing segregation comes through what we call Jim Crow laws. Now, Jim Crow as a character is on screen, and Jim Crow is a character from minstrel shows from the American South during the Gilded Age. Now, Jim Crow himself would have been played by a white actor in blackface. And so this is an incredibly offensive stereotype of how American white Southerners view black people during this period. And it gets applied to these laws as an attempt to segregate these two populations. And so when we think about Jim Crow laws, we're thinking about the various means through which American local communities in the South and state governments are attempting to legalize the segregation of white and black people in the South. And that brings us to one of the more notable stories from the American South, where we see a landmark Supreme Court case get involved. And so one of the pivotal moments here is going to be when a group of activist minded Americans in the South attempt to point out an issue in the kind of legislation that has been passed for segregation in the American South. And so Homer Plessy is a light-skinned black man. He is chosen for a reason. Because of the fact that he is light-skinned, it's going to point out the hypocrisy of this law. What they do is they ask Homer Plessy to get on to a railway car and sit in the white section of that railway car. Based on the idea that the accommodations between the two aren't equal and he should be afforded the same conditions as his fellow white passengers. Now, as you can assume from this type of narrative, we've seen this thing before in American history. He is going to be removed from the white section. He's going to be asked to sit in the black section of the railway car. And ultimately, this case is going to be brought before the Supreme Court that his rights as an American were violated by this removal from this part of the train. Now, Homer Plessy's case gets brought to the Supreme Court. And in the Supreme Court, ultimately, Plessy and his fellow advocates are trying to say that there was no equal accommodations afforded for Homer Plessy, so he sat in the white portion of the train. The most important part of this case, like most of these Supreme Court cases we've seen before, are going to be its effects. And so Homer Plessy is going to be ultimately told that there actually was nothing wrong with him being removed from that portion of the railway car since you have this idea that if the accommodations technically are equal for white and black people, you cannot say that any rights were violated. 
And again, this is fueled by this idea of legalizing Jim Crow segregation in the South, that you have these legal means of trying to keep these two races separate. And the decision by Plessy v. Ferguson is going to be that ultimately, so long as you have equal accommodations, you can keep the two races separate. And so this is where we get our famous doctrine of separate but equal, which fuels Jim Crow South for the better part of the rest of the early 1900s and into the 1960s. Now it is these Jim Crow laws that are ultimately going to be the focus of the civil rights movement once we get to the 1960s. And so it's so important to understand that this is first established well previously in the Gilded Age as an attempt to redesign the South along these racial lines. Now it's important to recognize that ultimately within the Gilded Age there are already activists and reformers who are aware of these issues that are facing African Americans in the American South and are attempting to find a way forward. How can you advance the cause of African Americans in the United States and promote equality of the races. And so the important thing to think about is that there's going to be two main schools of thought or two visions of how you can help African Americans achieve that equality, achieve that political freedom and economic independence that they're seeking at this point. And there's two main people we're gonna look at. One is Booker T. Washington on the left and then W.E.B. Du Bois on the right. These two men both are attempting to achieve these means of, of ensuring political and economic equality for African Americans during the Gilded Age, but have different means of getting that community there. So let's look at these two competing visions side by side. So Booker T. Washington is a former slave who is self-educated. His journey is very different from W.E.B. Du Bois' journey, to put that in perspective right out of the, right out of the gate. Booker T. Washington, again, is, is born a slave, self-educates himself, and he is going to be of the mindset of gradual equality for blacks in the United States. And so this course of let's seek equality slowly over time without pushing the needle too much becomes the course that Booker T. Washington is going to advocate. For. And so he is going to promote the idea that if you can train African Americans in vocational training, in jobs as mechanics, as agricultural workers, as farmers, give them these training and jobs that will provide them with a livelihood, you will slowly over time achieve equality for black people in America. But he is very much against this idea of immediate equality. He is promoting a long game of trying to ensure that black people are able to advance themselves in the United States. On the other hand, W.E.B. Du Bois is someone who was born in the North, who comes from an elite education. And so he's going to be much more ideological than Booker T. And so naturally for someone who comes from an elite education who is much more ideological in their approach to this issue, W.E.B. Du Bois is going to call for the immediate equality of blacks. That regardless of the history behind the conflict between black and white Americans, equality should occur immediately and there should be no debating about it. And so unlike Booker T. Washington, who's calling for the vocational training of African-Americans throughout the United States, W.B. Du Bois is saying, you should follow the elite educational opportunities, rise up in the system, and follow the exact same course that their white counterparts are attempting to achieve. And so both of these men are trying to find and advocate for the advancement and equality of black people in America and yet they're going about it in different ways to the point where you'll actually see some conflict between these two camps about how exactly you can achieve equality within the 19th century, if not into the 20th century. And so with that, we've covered how the Gilded Age is going to look in the South and the West. We see a much more industrial setting, at least advancing in the West. It makes sense when you think about the economic opportunities that are in the West and why it would cause for a rise in at least industrial capitalism there. And despite the fact that people like Henry Grady are calling for a new industrial era in the South, we ultimately see that that vision is never fully achieved, at least during the Gilded Age, and they fall back in the same pattern of struggling with the issue of race in the American South. And so with that, the only thing we have left is the dad joke of the day. Let's get to it. The joke of the day is brought to you by 
Ed puzzle. If you need a puzzle, call Ed. All right, here it is. Air used to be free at the gas station. Now it costs two fifty. You want to know why? Why? That was y'all. Inflation. <laughs> <sighs> okay, well with that, we are done now with the South and the West, and we're halfway done with the Gilded Age. So we will be back next time to look at how labor and the workers themselves are going to rise up and say, we don't like what's going on in the Gilded Age. And then we're going to look at political developments as a whole throughout the Gilded Age. And then we'll test, and y'all will be amazing, and you'll dominate it. <sighs> Before you go though, I do have a few more fun little questions to see how we're doing. And so use your notes to try and see how you do. And if you do poorly, guess what? We can redo this Ed Puzzle as many times as you want because you can prevent forest fires. And with that, y'all have a great day. I think y'all are amazing. And I'm so thankful I get to teach you. Bye. and welcome back to period six of AP US History. Today, we're gonna to be learning about the South and the West. What are you doing up there? Bye-bye <laughs> to everybody. You say bye-bye. Say bye-bye. Can you wave? Nope. Can you say, wave. Say bye-bye, everybody. Say bye-bye. <laughs> there you go. That's, that's a bye-bye. Bye-bye.